point? Why is it not? All right, Matt, why is it not? Okay, the find. As Andrea mentioned, they originally found in the sieve. Uh, brief reprise of the Kadesh excavations. In 1999 and 2000, a joint University of Michigan and University of Minnesota team working for multiple seasons until 2012 unexpectedly recovered 2,000 plus Hellenistic seal impressions from an archive room in a large administration building built in the Persian era but successively repurposed under the Ptolemies and Seleucids. The archive dates to, to the Seleucid control of the site from 200 to around 140 BCE and is partially contemporary with <coughs> archives at Seleucia on the Tigris, Uruk, and Delos. At this time, Kadesh lay in the territory of the Phoenician city of Tyre and was inhabited, we think, by a mixed Greco-Phoenician population. Here's the plan, the final plan as of 2012 of the Seleucid period Seleucid building. All but 90 of the ceilings were found in the back room, what we call the deep archive of a three-room complex. This is the archive complex. <coughs> this is the deep archive. A three-room complex buried under a rock-hard layer of burned mud brick and roof fall collapsed into the room as a result of an intense fire. We date this fire to shortly before 140 BCE. Interestingly, this room was the only one in the building to suffer such intense conflagration. Most show no fire damage. The other 90 ceilings, were fa except two, were found amid, amid debris on the floor of the central archive room. This little room that we originally thought was a corridor but has no doors onto the courtyard. So, corridor no more. From the time they were first cleaned in 1999, we could see that the real that the seal impressions from Kadesh presented a wide spectrum of artistic choices available at this time and place. They reflect, in some cases, local preferences, and in others, the official symbolism of the Seleucid dynasty. At one end, we have nine impressions from a seal that shows the Phoenician goddess Tanit with the Semitic in inscription, he who is over the land. We've all seen that a lot. <coughs> at the other end, we have six impressions from an official Seleucid anchor, horsehead seal. In the middle, it's the big, hundreds of impressions from seals representing Greek gods with their standard paraphernalia. The most striking examples, versions of Athena, the Athena Parthenos. You see her there with her spear and her complete Niki crowning her head and all of that. The imagery on these ceilings, some of them the small masterpieces of the glyptic arts, is well worth study on its own and for what it can tell us about the complex imaginaries of individuals living in a mixed Greek and Phoenician environment in times of shifting identities and political affiliations. In this paper, I will do just that, briefly summarizing the results of my iconographical work and comparing the choices made by the Kedish population to those at Seleucia and Uruk. Then, in the interest of, of addressing questions beyond iconography, the nature and function of the archive the numbers and status of the people using it, to what extent the transactions recorded and curated there were controlled by a hierarchical authority, what sort of authority that might be, and the relationship between these central authorities, local elites, and individual householders, I will move on to compare the Kaddish archive to others about which we have more information. The broader topics I outline above are all good questions but can we get credible answers to them without the documents to which the ceilings were attached? One path is by comparison with collections from other archives about which we know more or from which we actually have surviving documents, and that's very rare. However, this is a path to be tried very carefully and with much wariness. Hellenistic ceiling practices were complex and varied in a myriad of ways more of which you'll know about at the end of this lecture than you ever dreamed, even in your worst nightmares. I underline this complexity in the title of the paper. All archives are local and unique, like snowflakes, and finding solid ground on which to base comparisons is as treacherous as walking on quicksand.
As you all know, after the thrill of discovery comes the bookkeeping routine of identification and classification of finds such as these, a sometimes tedious process, but not without its own discoveries. And this is a selection of what we had in the beginning, all we knew, 2,000 plus impressions from an unknown number of seals, dated to circa 200 to 150 BCE. This, this identification process, yes. This identification process is not always straightforward, uh, but here you see again in the beginning the scale drawings of a whole variety and as Andrea mentioned, the papyrus background of all of our seals. Uh, identification is not always straightforward, and in humility, uh, I give you one of our mistakes. For, ins for instance, in the initial identification, I had called this figure, oh. let's get the difference between the pointer, anyway, I had called <laughs> This figure, uh, the most commonly used seal at Kadesh, an Aphrodite anadiomene, the goddess emerging from the sea and tying up her hair. I show a full statuette of the common mo Hellenistic motif here. The body on the ceiling is rounded and plump, but somewhat androgynous. The seal was too large for the pellet of clay on which it was impressed, and consequently, the figure's left arm is missing. I think the battery went dead on this, so we'll just have to deal without it. Um, only a few of the 82 impressions from this seal preserve that arm. But these, but those that do, reveal that the figure is a naked archer with a bow in his left arm and reaching back to a quiver with his right, not doing his hair up, but getting ready to shoot. A decidedly androgynous Apollo. I completed the process of sorting and identifying together with ascertaining how many iterations of individual seal rings appeared in the archive in the summer of 2015. And this graph shows the beginning of the results. We have been able to make out the images on 1,719 of the impressions. The subject matter is for the most part derived from Greek models uh, and dominated by representations of Greek gods, human portrait busts, and other anthropomorphic figures. You can see that, put all the anthropomorphics on one side, 87%, and all the others at 13%. I digress now for a moment, I hope only a moment, on the vocabulary I'm using, because over the century and a half that, publication, that publications on archives have been appearing in many languages, this is varied in important ways that can hinder cross comparisons of archives. It is critical to distinguish clearly between three objects involved in and produced by the sealing process. First, there is the seal itself, most often an intaglio ring or stamp, as you see on the lower right. Then there is the object on which it is impressed, usually a lump of clay, which I and others call a sealing, but is often confusingly called a bulla. These ceilings come in various forms, one that can be called a bulla. And finally, the third thing, you have the seal, you have the ceiling on which the seal or seals are impressed, and finally, there are the impressions made by the seal rings on the ceilings. And the ceilings can carry anywhere from one to 40 impressions. Right? And you see examples of that here, for instance, the. Mesopotamian ring bulla, napkin ring bulla on the upper right, the uh, ceiling from Delos with multiple impressions is probably from an appended string. These ceilings come in various forms and can be attached to documents in various ways. You see many of them on this slide. Flat, flattish lumps of clay applied directly to papyrus or appended with a string are the most common. These sometimes, these sometimes bear a single impression and at other times uh, carry are impressed from multiple seals as the central one from Delos. Then there is the napkin ring bulla, limited in use to Mesopotamia and combining older tablet sealing practices with new Greek. These three artifacts, 
seal, sealing, and impression. Connect us in different ways to the sealers, the choice itself, the choice of seal itself, and its imagery offering the most direct connection. Also, however, the patterns of distribution of impressions within an archive can offer important clues about the nature of that archive. I will return to this later. Thankfully, all but one of the Kedish ceilings carry only single impressions from one of a selection of intaglio rings, most oval in shape, but some circular or rectangular. All the ceilings show marks of papyrus on the reverse where that surface is preserved. The identifiable impressions come from 1,309 seal rings. The great majority, nearly 90% of the seals, were used only once. These numbers have a purpose. They're not just here to be numbers, and I'm going to come back to them. This graph compares the choice of subject matter as percent of seals used in the archive, not as the number of impressions, because it is the ring that represents the choices of the individual members of the population. As a rule, one seal can be taken to represent one individual, although there are a few exceptions from other archives <coughs> where we can see that a single seal was occasionally used by more than one person. The photographs here show impressions from a selection of seals used more than once at Kadesh. The numbers below the images note the numbers of time the seal was used in the archive. So our Seleucid anchor we find six times. Our archer Apollo, the misidentified Anadiomene, is our most um, frequent use, 82 times. Uh, a portrait of one of the Seleucids, six times. Uh, the Phoenician Tanit, nine times. None of them enormous numbers. The owner of our Apollo archer seal, with his 82 iterations, was clearly an important person in record keeping at Kadesh. Beyond the overwhelmingly anthropomorphic Greek iconography of the image, images chosen for seals, what might these numbers tell us about the nature of the Kadesh archive, the identities and numbers of people using the archive, and the types of documents stored there? The loss of the documents themselves makes answers to these questions elusive at best, but study of other Hellenistic archives and the sealing practices employed in them can provide important clues. I turn now to that comparative study. There are 16 published sites from Carthage in the west to Seleucia in the east where caches of sealings dated to the Hellenistic era have been found in excavated contexts. At least four of these sites, Elephantine, Seleucia, Uruk, and Zugma, were home to more than one archive. Most of these archives are exclusively Hellenistic in date, others begin earlier, and some continue into the Roman era. About half the archives, marked in red on the map, have been fully published, and I will concentrate on those. The fine spots of the archives are as diverse as simple household jars found in domestic contexts, to temples, to massive buildings dedicated to state bureaucracy. Likewise, the records curated in these various places could number from a very few documents relevant to a single household to many thousands in municipal archives such as Seleucia. The relation between numbers of ceilings and numbers of documents, however, is rarely one-to-one, -one, as we shall see. Before moving on to this next question, I would like to give a couple of examples of what we can do with just the iconography, comparing Kedesh Seleucia and Uruk, the low-hanging fruit, so to speak. Here, comparing the choice of gods for seal imagery as percent of seals used in, in the Seleucia and Kedesh archives, we can see a consistent popularity of Greek mythological types and a preponderance of anthropomorphic figures across both archives. There is background variation in the gods chosen, Apollo most popular at Kedesh, Eros at Seleucia, but overall, the Greekness is manifest. However, the archives do exhibit local tastes and traditions as well. We've already seen the Tanits at Kadesh uh, and the presence of the Phoenician goddess and the mixture of her iconography with standard Greek 
Greek Aphrodite iconography, as I have argued elsewhere, is a fascinating example of reciprocal interaction. Uh, the Aphrodite and the Diomenes, not Apollos here, uh, there are a lot more resemblance to the frightening Ashtarts and Tanits of the Eastern tradition than they do to the beautiful Aphrodites. Likewise, at Seleucia, mm -hmm. likewise, at Seleucia, the Mesopotamian gods Nabu and Nanea appear sporadically. The Nabu seal here was used over 800 times. So although there's, although there's only two of them, one of them was used 800 times. It was the owner of that seal was an important person. Moving beyond the anthropomorphic category and comparing animal representations at Kedis, Seleucia, and Uruk, we can see a striking difference between the choices made by the seal users at Kedesh and Seleucia on the one hand and at Uruk on the other. At Kedesh and at Seleucia, <coughs> most of the animal types are from nature, such as the eagle, horse, and nursing deer, pictured here from Kedesh. Centaur and winged felines and winged horses are among the mythological figures, standards in Greek mythology. Not so at Uruk. While there are a good number of Greek gods and heroes, and you see the comparisons between anthropomorphic and animal here, and there are many more animals at Uruk. Um, so while there are a good number of Greek gods and heroes, fantastic animals of a distinct Mesopotamian flavor dominate the assemblage. Winged lions, fishmen, and such, and many of the, many of the human figures even wear non-Greek clothing. The tastes of the local notability appear to be asserting themselves at a rook. This was a class mostly missing from the newly founded Seleucia, which was the population of which was brought in from Greece and Macedonia. I am not the first to note this about a rook slash worka, but the graph format is particularly compelling. Returning now to the topic of sealing practices, I compare here the usage pattern of seals at Seleucia and Kadesh in times of how many seals at, of how many seals are used more than once and how many times. Uh, here you see the pattern at Kadesh, where the vast majority of the seals are used only once. And we have that singular example of an Apollo that's used 82 times. It's very different at Seleucia. At Seleucia, there are many more repeats, and tax seals dominate the collection, with some 92 tax seals accounting for nearly half of the impressions identified. That is, 92 tax seals produced 15,000 of the known 30,000 impressions from Seleucia. And in this graph, you see the comparison of seals at Kadesh 1309 to impressions versus seals at Seleucia to impressions. Very, very different. And again, there is a point to this. I'm going to come back to it. It's more than a, than a weird factoid in numbers. I return now to the broader question of how to get at the function of any given archive and the status of its users, working with those that have been fully published. I begin this survey with the goal of, I began this survey with the goal of throwing some light on the nature of the Kedesh archive, which is in many ways anomalous. By comparing it to demonstrably public or private archives, such as the municipal archive at Seleucia on the Tigris and the household collections from Elephantine. We tend to organize our questions about the functions of archives around where they might fall on a spectrum characterized at the extremes as public and private. Useful variables, many of which are difficult to dig out of the published data, incl include building type, numbers and subjects of documents, numbers of users, sealing practices, and subjects of seals. None of these categories is foolproof. Copies of transactions sealed by public officials can be and often are kept in private houses. And conversely, private documents stored for safety in public buildings. In truth, there are few archives that can be said to fall completely at either extreme 
of the public-private spectrum. Most seem to have contained a mix of what might be called public and private documents within buildings of mixed use. Seleucia, as home to both public and private archives, provides a pertinent example of this. We have evidence there for du duplicate tax documents stored in the state archive and private houses. Okay, back to this nightmare slide. Then there is the elephant in the room. How do we reliably answer any of these numerical questions in the absence of the documents themselves? From the variety of practices demonstrated on extant documents, it is clear that we cannot equate one ceiling with one document. Nor in the case of multiply impressed ceilings can we equate one ceiling with one individual. I hold out hope that for the most part, we can equate one seal with one individual. And in the case of multiply used seals, a given seal is used only once on a document. So that, for instance, at Kedesh, with its 1,309 identified seals, there were that many individuals sealing the documents, and a minimum know, of 82 documents, given the 82 Apollo archers. Can we do better than this? I certainly hope so. To, th to address that, I now turn to three sites where we have documents and ceilings preserved together. These three sites are Wadi Dalia in the Judean Desert, Elephantine in Upper Egypt, and Uruk, of course, in Mesopotamia. And you can spot them there. I start with the Wadi Dalia cave. In 1962, Bedouin tribesmen found a cache of 4th century BCE Aramaic papyri, ceilings, coins, and jewelry in a cave about 14 kilometers north of Jericho. Subsequent excavation brought the total number of ceilings to 128. These materials were found together with the skeletons of over 200 men, women, and children, thought to be families of Samarian elites unsuccessfully fleeing the forces of Alexander with their prized possessions. The papyri and the ceilings were, pu were published separately in 1997 and in 2001. The papyri were all in an advanced state of decay. There were some 28 well enough preserved to determine, determine the topic of the document. 15 of the papyri named the city of Samaria and it's thought that all were signed and sealed there. At least half concerned slave sales and the remainder deal with land transactions of various sorts. Signatures on the papyri range from two to eight and include contractees, witnesses, and the governor and prefect of Samaria, who may have been required to endorse all the contracts. The only official signers are these two. Here are some ceilings from Wadi Dalia. Only 24 ceilings are still attached to the papyri when found. The greatest number placed on a single papyrus were seven. Get that, one ceiling does not equal one document. Five other papyri held one to five ceilings. All 24 attached ceilings were fixed to the exterior of fully rolled papyri, and all but one carried only a single impression. Comparing the ceilings attached to papyri with the signers attested in the documents, we can see that in some cases there are more ceilings than ce there are more ceilings than signers, and in <coughs> others more signers than sealers. Only two seals were used more than once. One of these appears five times. That's the fellow in the upper right. Um, three times attached, to, two times attached to papyri, and three times loose. The, the two associated papyri document slave sales, and the other a building lease. The motif from the seal is that of the Persian hero flanked by winged sphinxes. The involvement of the owner of this seal in five separate transactions implies that he was an important member of the Samaria community. Frank Cross suggests that the seal belonged to Yehonar, identified as a wealthy slave owner on one document, and the only name appearing on both of those sealed with this, both documents sealed with this seal. The other duplicate seal appears twice, once on a document containing a slave sale and once loose. It depicts a satyr. The scarcity of duplicate seals in the collection <laughs> implies that we were dealing with a large number of contracting individuals and no professional witness class. 
Two sealings carry impressions from two seals that are restored as inscribed in Paleo-Hebrew with the name of Yeshihu, son of Sanballat, governor of Samaria. That's the lower one here. It is of note that although the governor is thought to have signed every document, only two of his sealings were found. There is no indication of correspondence between these local officials and higher-ups in the Persian administration, leading to the conclusion that the documents are private family records. The large number of bodies in the cave indicate that we are dealing with more than one family, at least we hope, uh, but the number of family archives represented in the cave cannot be determined. The local nature of the archive is further supported by a recent petrographic study of the clays used in the ceilings. All samples proved to be of local clay. I turn now to the two Hellenistic arch next, the two Hellenistic archives found by Rubinson on Elephantine Island in Upper Egypt. The two archives, Fund 1 and Fund 2, of those, Fund 1 contained five sealed papyri recording private family contracts undertaken between 311 and 285 BCE. Four of the papyri were found bound together and a fifth was separate. The four bound together were standard six witness documents. The fifth was a simple receipt with just <coughs> two witnesses. Here are some of the so, hmm. here are some of the so-called six witness documents from Fund One that Van Dort presented in the 1993 Turin Sealing Congress. The transactions recorded include a wedding contract, a will, two payments involving the same principal, and an agreement between two brothers over an inheritance. Fund one yielded a total of 12 ceilings, and the individual papyri carry two to three ceilings. Again, one ceiling does not indicate one record. Each of those ceilings carried two to four impressions for a total of 33 impressions. Impressions from the seals of 32 individuals are attested, but one seal is used by three different people. In the first instance, by two brothers, and in the second, by an unrelated party. There is one instance where a seal is pressed twice on the same ceiling. All but two of the seals are Greek in style. The exceptions represent the Egyptian god Thoth, used by a Greek lady named Callista, and a copy of the scarab of Thutmose III, used by another Greek. So symbols don't connect with ethnicity directly. Um, interestingly, the texts indicate that the four six witness contracts were originally consigned to different guardians, or syngraphilikoi as they are called, and only brought together in the jar of Fund One at a later date. Yet another complication at getting at the people here. Fund Two, stored in a jar in the basement of another house, contained 32 documents pertaining to business conducted by two priests, practors of the Temple of Edfu, on behalf of the temple between 225 and 222 BCE. The correspondence is mostly that of the priest, Mylon of Edfu, and his superior Euphronius Euphroni in Diospolis Magna, and petitions to Mylon from locals. What is this correspondence doing in Elephantine? And how, did it end up, and how it ended up there is unclear. The letters indicate some financial malfeasance on the part of Mylon. Perhaps he is hiding out. The Louvain Papyrus Project classifies the archive as official. Uh, but we would wonder about that. Only three of the 28 papyri are sealed, each carrying one sealing with one impression. One of the three seals, a comic mask, belongs to the priest Euphronius. The others are from correspondents Paniscus and Philo Philomon. It would seem, it seem, however, with these, I forget, it's, is it 33 papyri, only three of which are sealed, that the practices for sealing contracts and letters are not, surprisingly, surprisingly different. The contracts require the seals from contractees and multiple witnesses, while the letters demand only the seal of the writer or no seal at all. I now turn to my final collection of seal impression with documents. The remarkable Hellenistic cuneiform tablets of Uruk. 
A large number of sealed documents were stored in the Russian Irogar temples at Uruk during the Hellenistic era, dating from 323 to 141 BCE. They were written on both clay tablets, which preserved the documents and seal impressions together, and parchment, or rarely papyrus, from which only the ring bulli and some attached sealings survive. And you see the mix here on this slide. The language of the tablets is Akkadian. That on the lost parchments is thought to be Aramaic or Greek. The sealed material that can be definitely assigned to the temples comes to us from controlled excavations conducted by various German teams throughout the 20th century and published by Lindstrom in 2003. Many more tablets and bulli come from Uruk, but not specifically from the temples, and have been extensively analyzed by Ronald Wallenfels, whose work I will refer to. Published and sealed artifacts from the German excavations include 572 ring bulli, 62 applied sealings or tags, and 61 cuneiform tablets, often found together in the same rooms. A total, again these numbers I'll come back to, of 1,452 impressions from 1,190 seals could be identified. Some were used on all three methods of sealing. Over half the transactions recorded that we have preserved on the 61 sealed tablets published from the controlled excavations are land sales or lease, or lease contracts or other land division. The next most common, 15, deal with temple prebends, and there are two slave sales. Other overlooked tablets also show this concentration on land deals. The occupations of some of the sealers and their function on the recorded transaction are also noted on some of the tablets. These show a wide range of classes involved, from shepherds, fishermen, and courtyard sweepers, to temple officials, scribes, and overseers. Some are designated as Greek, and others as citizens of Uruk or Babylon. The numbers of impressions on the tablets excavated from the temples vary from two to 28. Most carry 10 on average. In total, there are 318 readable impressions. These derive from 310 individual seals, so almost one to one. Only eight seals are used more than once, and these all appear on two tablets. The ring bulli show a similar pattern, but the attached ceilings almost all carry single impressions. Looking at the subject matter of the seals used on the tablets, ring bulli, and attached ceilings, we see differences in, um, in choices of images and in pattern of use. Let us look first at the category of official seals, that is, those that can be associated with Seleucid bureaucracy. Lindstrom identified 25 different official seals on the ring bulli excavated from the temples. Most of these were identified by inscription. You can see a couple here, as from the office of the Kraofulax, often specifically the Kraofulax of Warka. A few others mention the salt tax or another levy. Some 34 of the 572 ring bulli from excavated contexts display impressions from these official seals. Most only one, although occasionally an official will stamp, will stamp a tax office seal twice on one ring bulla. In contrast, only one tablet of all those known from a rook, both excavated and looted, and these number in the thousands, only one carries an official seal. This would seem to imply that the transactions recorded on the tablets do not require official state or temple sanction. The placement of the official seals on the ring bulli is also of interest. Here are some ring bulli, a real one on the upper right, and then flattened out with the drawings of the actual seals on the rest of the slide. Although Rostatsev, in, in his 1932 influential publication on, on bulli from Babylonia, thought the placement of the impressions on ring bulli was random, Wallenfels, in his careful study of the material, has convincingly shown there to be some method in this seeming madness. Many of the bulli carry a band of impressed circles dividing the stamps into two hemispheres. It seems likely that, just as the principles of the transactions recorded on the tablets appear on one edge of a given tablet, the principles stamping the ring bulli 
used one hemisphere, which Wallenfels calls the primary hemisphere. This is borne out by the placement of the 34 official stamps identified on the excavated ring bullae. Where enough of the bulla is preserved to see the position of the stamps, all but five of the official impressions appear in the primary hemisphere of the bulla. Oh, again, number one on the upper one there and elsewhere. Where there are, where they are not in the primary hemisphere, the position, that position is held by another official seal, most always that of the cryophulex. <coughs> While the ring bullae carry a higher but still small number, circa 6% of official seals, on our third category, the, the attached seals, the official seals are dominant, and you see a collection of those here. 49 of those 62 sealings, nearly 71%, carry official stamps. In terms of iconography on the seals used, we also see distinctions among the three sealing media, tablets, ring bullae, and attached sealings. The figures pictured on the inscribed crow fulac seals are all Greek. These include Seleucid monarchs, from a posthumous Seleucus I to Demetrius I. Gods and heroes are also represented, the most common being Apollo, Athena, and Nike. All but three of the official seals are used more than once. The one used most often, 23 times, is, is ahead of Antiochus IV with radiant crown. The other main official category, tax seals, are all aniconic. The inscriptions document taxes on salt, sales, slaves, and water transport. Of the over 1,100 impressions from the excavated collection, only 28 tax stamps survive. Considerably more impressions from the office of the Crow Fulax and other administrators, some 84 are preserved. Still, the official seal impressions impress, represent less than 10% of the corpus. This is very different <coughs> from the civic archive at Seleucia, where tax stamps constitute over half the corpus. The thousand or so impressions from seals of private individuals, from private individuals at Uruk present a more varied lot in terms of iconography and usage. A much smaller percentage of them are used more than once, only 45 on the ring bullae and eight on the tablets. While there are a good number of Greek gods and heroes, fantastic animals of a distinct Mesopotamian flavor dominate the assemblage, and many of the human figures wear non-Greek clothing. Likewise, the names captioning the seals on the tablets are overwhelmingly Semitic. Although imagery with roots in Mesopotamian, Mesopotamia in Mesopotamian forms form the main majority of the impressions on both tablet and ring bullae, Greek-style rings are used over twice as often on the ring bullae than on the tablets, but over 30 individuals seal both tablets and parchment documents. They're all signed. After all this, what can we say about the nature of the archives stored in the Rush and Irigal temples at Uruk? The small percentage of official seals indicates that these are not public or administrative archives, but rather secure storage spaces for the records of private individuals and families. The low rate of multiple stamping points to no individual or group of individuals dominating the business being transacted, although prose, although po prose epigraphical studies present a slightly different story. The restriction of the official seals to <coughs> ring bullae and applied sealings indicates a clear preference for recording state-sanctioned documents in Greek or Aramaic, the official language of the Seleucid regime. To recap, where has the survey of archives with texts and ceilings preserved brought us? Possibly to the brink of despair. Um, we have Wadi Dahlia, this is the recap slide, with its singly impressed ceilings applied in multiple numbers to single papyri recording slave sales and land deals. Elephantine Fund One with multiply impressed ceilings of groups of three or four on single papyri recording family business. Elephantine Fund Two bearing loan singly impressed ceilings on official temple letters. The Uruk tablets of land and other transactions sealed by two to 28 participants and its single, singly impressed official Seleucid attached ceilings. It is clear that drawing any reliable connection between numbers of ceilings and numbers of documents is impossible. 
Perhaps, though, we can say one ring bulla equals one document. Likewise, seeking significant connections between numbers of ceilings and numbers of impressions is a fool's errand. More impressions and more ceilings separate larger archives from smaller, but that's not rocket science. One numerical relationship, I did say I was going to come back to these numbers, for which I continue to hold out some hope of significance, is the ratio of seals in a given archive to their frequency of use. Returning to criteria for determining range of use, among which are fine spot and subject matter of documents, we can all agree that the archive excavated in Seleucia's Agora is a municipal archive, while the status of Kedesh is up in the air. If we compare the ratio of seals used and the frequency of their multiple use, we see a distinct difference. And I showed you that before. Uh, might there be a pattern to be, termined, to be determined if that information is brought together for all the archives for which it is published? Well, here it is. I have gathered here the numbers of ceilings, impressions, and seals, as well as the fine spot and dates of use for the excavated Hellenistic archives for which we have those numbers, and some in which we don't. The column headed by percent at the far right is the ratio of seals to impressions. This is very much a work in progress and is a very blunt instrument. But it is my contention that when that number is very low, likely indicating that the number of seals were used in that numbers of seals were used in massive multiples, <coughs> we are dealing with a practice in which a central authority is being exerted. Where that number is very high, as in the household archives of Seleucia, Elephantine, and Wadi Dalia, we are dealing with private archives. In most case, this is cases, this is backed up by the domestic fine spots, so it might be considered redundant. But in other instances, where fine spots are not so clear, or not what they seem, such as the Nomophilakian on Cyprus on, at Cyrene, this possibility can take on more significance. And I'll just give you, this is, this is a brand new slide that I haven't shown before. Uh, the colors indicate the fine spots. And you can see that, for the most part, the orange households have these very high ratios. When we look at things from Agoraz, the uh, Nomophilakian at Cyrene stands out like a sore thumb, that one green thing among all the orange. Um, I'm now going to look very briefly at two other archives, those from the Carthage Temple and the Punic Agora of Salinas, where, where these numbers factor in. I, ca I call this ratio number the magic number, okay? The magic number of Carthage is quite low, the Carthage Temple, around 22%. And that of Salinas is 51% in the middle. But they get to these numbers in different ways. First to the Carthage archive. Between 1989 and 1994, the German Archaeological Institute recovered 4,025 clay ceilings while excavating the temple precinct of Baal and Tanit at Carthage. Almost all are single impressions on pieces of clay with papyrus marks on the back. Only 28 carry more than one impression. Although the ceilings were found in disturbed deposits, the connection with the temple is clear. Based on stylistic analysis of the seal images, the archive dates from the 6th to the 2nd centuries BCE. The majority of the seals belong to the 5th and 4th centuries, and very few to the 3rd and 2nd. The ceilings fall into two distinct categories, almost equal in number. The first is a group of 1998, let's say 2000, that carry impressions from a scarab or nearly identical scarabs imitating the cartouche of Tutmosis III. And you see those there on the left. The impressions in the second group of 2,027 pieces bear Greek-style images of humans, animals, and other natural subjects. These impressions come from repeated use of around 864 seals. Dietrich Berges, who published the Greek-style impressions in 1997, Populates, postulates that the Greek-style seals belong to individuals and the scarabs to officials. He suggests further that the almost one-to-one -one ratio of personal to official slash scarab seals indicates that each, each of the lost documents carried one official 
and one personal seal. If this is true, and it does seem highly likely, the system used in the Carthage Temple archive must have been strictly controlled by the officials who used the scarab <coughs> seals. The dominant use of an anachronistic pharaonic scarab as the official seal in the Carthage archive is unparalleled in other Hellenistic archives. This may point to the archive being an administrative temple archive rather than merely a safe place to store records, as at Uruk. <coughs> the other and last archive I'm going to look at, it, ex it also exhibits this degree of control by a limited number of officials. That is Salinas on the island of Sicily. The archive consists of a collection of 688 ceilings, of which 589 carry recognizable in imprints from 400 or so seals. Each ceiling carried between one and three impressions. Most were found in excavations between 1876 and 1883 in and around Temple C on the Acropolis of Salinas in Sicily. The original excavator thought the ceilings were part of a temple archive in use between the destruction by the Carthaginians of the first iteration <coughs> of the temple in 409 BCE and its second destruction by the Romans in 250 BCE. While the style of the impressions does align with these dates, more recent work on the Acropolis of Salinas indicates that the area was not used primarily for temples during these centuries, but was rather the site of a new agora built and used by Carthaginians and their allies. The reported find spots of the ceilings from the original excavations do not allow the identification of the building in which they were found, but from their discovery in the agora, it seems likely that they came from some subsection of a municipal building, possibly a stoa, as a dura or pella. Archives I mercifully haven't told you about today. The legible impressions number around 848 from 538 ceilings. Only 28 seals were used more than once, most only two or three times. Two seal types prove the exception, and you see them here. These dominate the collection, and their pattern of use offers evidence of the official nature of the archive beyond the fine spot. There are 285 impressions of a single type, a dolphin over a club, that's illustrated here, and another 129 of a naked beardless Heracles with a bull. This one is very large, some 34 millimeters in diameter. It appears by itself 104 times and together with one or two other seals 24 times. Further supporting its identification as a municipal seal, as Carlo Zoppi pointed out in the 1993 Turin conference, is the presence of the letter Sigma, standing for Salonunte, we think, on four-fifths of its appearances. The dolphin appears on 216 ceilings as the central of three stamps. Of the other 400 seal types known from Salinas, one is duplicated 20 times and the other few two or three times. This overwhelming domination by two seal types indicates that two important officers <coughs> witnessed or validated almost every transaction at Salinas. The location of the official seals, the official seals at the center of thrice stamped ceilings recalls the lo location of the official seals on the primary hemisphere of the ring bulli from a rook. Well, I brought you around the world of Hellenistic archives in a whirlwind 45 minutes. I hope not much longer. And now return to my starting point of the Kedish find and how it can be located within this world. My intention in this survey was not so much to generate new data, but to bring together in one format, insofar as possible, what we know about the archives found and variously published between 1883 and 2016. The purpose being to get on the same page about what we know, what we do not know, what we should seek to know, and what is unknowable. Looking once again at the list of variables we might apply to determine the nature of an archive, uh, and applying it to Kedish. In terms of building type, our archive is found in a building of mixed use, not in an, an agora, a building which serves the administrative functions, among others, of gathering and dispersal of goods and public entertainment. The documents in the archive then could be those of the regime, or more likely, 
a mix of such and private documents. In terms of numbers of individuals participating in the transactions recorded in the archive, we can posit a minimum of 1,309 based on the assumption that one seal generally equals one individual. In terms of how many documents were stored there, we are on much less firm ground given the evidence we have from other archives of anywhere between one and 28 or even 40 sealers on documents around the world. My own instinct is that the Kaddish documents likely held from three to four stamps, giving us a total of five to 700 documents. Looking at the use pattern of these seals and the prevalence of seals used only once and the absence of any seal or group of seals repeated massively, the small numbers of seals that can be deemed official and the storage of the archive in a building with a demonstrated public function, I would say that at Kadesh, as at the Uruk temples and elsewhere, we have a repository <coughs> of mostly <coughs> private transactions held for safekeeping by a third party or parties involved in the administration of the site. And that's where I am as of today. And at this point, I would welcome comments and suggestions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, we will take questions and I will pass around the microphone. Anybody like to start? Gerald. Well, actually, it's not a question, it's an information. Uh, there is a dot which is missing in your onion. Uh, yes, uh, it's an information. Uh, there is a collection of more than 100, uh, uh, how do you call them, Seal, uh, ceilings that were found in Polistaba, Mosas, Kitopolis, and uh, they are going to be published this year. <laughs> and I'm really sorry that uh, you don't know about them, but... Uh, I do know them, but... Did you see them? Did you see them? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Others? Lenny. <coughs> there was a good point you made earlier on that uh, you look at one archive, you look at another, and there's very little common ground. And that's uh, a problem that you also have, for example, in uh, seal works for workshops from the Iron Age. In the uh, Judea of the 8th century, you have the bone workshop and you have the bronze, the bronze tabloid workshop and there's nothing in common. And uh, that's problematic because uh, you think you're going to get a lot of information from another archive and you don't get much at all. Donald is most interested and is most up to date on that, but I have chosen to go after the way, you know, whoever made them, the way they're used and the patterns of use and how to place Kedosh that way. We do think that the workshops that produced the Kedosh seals were probably mostly on, uh, mostly from the city of Tyre or Akko. People weren't going far for these, and they're quite generic in, in many ways. Sam. Uh, thank you for your interesting and comprehensive uh, lecture. Uh, I have one small question. Uh, for the Tanit uh, impressions, does this, uh, I notice they're inscribed. Is, does the word Tanit appear on any of them? No, no, no. There's only one seal, and it's these nine times. I mean, it does not appear on it, but the the iconography is, is really quite clear from the Tophet at Carthage, where she is named, and in, in other places. But no, the name is not there. The iconography is clear, but the identification with Tanit has been uh, contested. I know, it has been contested, and there are reasons at different times and places, but I'm pretty convinced by the inscribed stele from, um, from Carthage where the goddess is identified. Just 
just want to add it's more interesting that the person who, who used that seal did not, ident did not identify himself on the seal. It just says he was o over the land. His name is missing. It's very unusual. That's like the office of the Crow Fulux of Rurka. It's the office, not the person, that's important. Gerald. This time is the, uh, not really a question, but I'm wondering, is there anybody who was crazy enough to try to, to find among the gems uh, some that were used for making the ceiling, some ceilings? OK. <laughs> Thanks for your answer. <laughs> Not that I know of. Great. I'll ask a question. A um, little bit peripheral, we saw several impressions of Tutmosis III. And uh, I wonder, what's the consensus? Are these understood to be private seals or official seals? Because I know that Ptolemy II, in particular, took a special interest in, in Tutmosis III in a variety of ways. Well. The fact that of the 1998, and again, these were published by two different people putting these things together, it's quite the detective job. Um, Berges estimates that of those 1998 the III stamps, they're made from only four seals. So going on the basis that the more seal is used, the more likely it is to be an official's. Uh, and, and this is such a difference between the private iconography and those, and the number that it can't just be circumstantial, that they're almost equivalent, those two. This idea that there was one Tutmosis seal and one or one or more private seals on e each document, I think is pretty convincing, and I think it's got to be an official seal. But it's very strange why Punic officials in the 6th to 2nd century BCE are using these anachronistic. I mean, they're not made back in the time of Tutmosis III, and we find them in other places. They're harking back to his glory or whatever. I mean, but that'd be one thing for Egyptians, but another for Punic folk? <laughs> it, it's just, it's quite puzzling. Would you say what? Would yeah. one guess that maybe it is an Egyptian? In Carthage? It's highly unlikely, but you know, stranger things have happened. Could alien abductees? I don't <laughs> uh, I, I was wondering whether the the percentages of of how how often these ceilings uh, reappear uh, might say something about the type of documents that are being stored, because it seems that so it's not sort of an integrative thing where a lot of the same people are constantly uh, sealing uh, documents, but all kinds of different individuals, so does that say something about the archive itself? Well, it does, I think. The seals that are official uh, should be on documents that need to be officially validated, and some documents do, and some documents don't, and the best corpus we have to look at that is um, a look where we have so many that are sealed together with the tablets and the salient thing there is of the thousands of those tablets only one has an official Seleucid seal. So those transactions, those land transactions and those slave sales, and the, they don't seem to need the official validation of the Seleucid hierarchy. The documents that were sealed by the rainbow eye and the, you know, the clay ones, they probably did, but we have lost those documents. So we can't really know. Um, again, this is the, the great frustrating thing about studying these ancient archives, the loss of the documents in almost all of them. But we can see from the work that standard slave sales, standard land transactions, and various things 
do not need official sanction because they are missing the um, they're missing the official seals. And we have enough that have official seals that we know it's not because they're not there and they're not sealing. Did that answer at least somewhat? No, you don't look completely satisfied. We don't it doesn't seem to be the case. No. It, and not in the other two we looked at. Not at but we have it from Ready Dahlia Cave, we have those same two local officials appearing every time. On the Elephantine rooms, we have no officials for the most part. Okay, final question, comments. I just want to add to, add to the answer what you just heard. Um, if you go to Uruk, and then those documents, you will see the proportions between slaves and other kinds of categories there. So it'll give you, I mean, internally, you might see what, th what they're focusing on, uh, and, and that's something that uh, Sharon didn't answer, and I think if you're interested in that, the work is a great place to start. Great. Thank you, Sharon, for an excellent lecture. <laughs> Please stick around for more food and beverage. Thanks for coming.